Hello, I'm Patricia Cohen. I'm the Global Economics Correspondent for the New York Times. And I'm here in Marrakesh at the annual meeting of the World Bank at the IMF. And I'm here with Timothy Ash, who's a strategist at RBC Blue Bay and an associate fellow at Chatham House. And with Charles Litchfield, who's the deputy director of the Geo Economic Center at the Atlantic Council. And we're going to talk about an issue that has been coming up uh, with more frequency at these meetings and, and outside this meeting as well as to what to do with the Russian assets that were frozen after that country invaded Ukraine. There's somewhere in the in the neighborhood of 300 billion, possibly more, uh, that's held in different countries. Um, Going back to uh, when the invasion first happened, uh, I think people were surprised by how swiftly countries agreed to do this. And over the last 19 months or so, it seems an increasing number of people have come out and started to argue that perhaps the international community should think about confiscating those assets and using them to uh, compensate uh, uh, Ukraine or use it for reconstruction. So. Um, Tim, let me start with you. And, and it seems to me there's three different questions that have to be answered. So, so one is, is this the moral, ethical thing to do? You know, put aside anything else. The second is, is it legal under both international law and U.S. law? And third, even if both of those are true, will it accomplish the policy objective that we wanted to? So let me, let me start first with you. Well, I think the moral case is absolute. You know, Russia is clearly the instigator of this war, of the invasion. It's conducting war crimes and, I would say, genocide in Ukraine. Huge cost. Uh, the Kiev School of Economics and the World Bank, I think, earlier this year, I think March estimated the cost of $349 billion for reconstruction and counting, you know, when the war ends, somewhere over $500 billion. You know, I think it's, uh, you know, the, 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 the perpetrator of the crime should pay for the crime, mm -hmm. not the victim, not Ukraine. Right. And I struggle to see how the Western taxpayer, Western creditors, should ultimately pay for the reconstruction right. and the damage that Russia's done. Right. Um, and, and mixing the other two questions a little bit together, I mean, I think in the end, I think we have to think big picture about this. I'd say that Ukraine's victory and successful reconstruction is the most important project for the Western Alliance since the fall of communism, 89-91. Hmm. And it's about reconstructing Ukraine successfully so it can defend itself and defend us, uh, and making Ukraine a, a place that is fit for Ukrainians when they come home. Remember, there'll be a million demobilized soldiers uh, when, you know, when the war ends coming, mm -hmm. expecting something better. Right. And if we don't deliver successful recovery, then you know, no, no one's focusing on what it means for Ukraine right. <laughs> in terms of potentially destabilization, mm -hmm. migrants, all that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So it's a really important project. We have to get it right. The costs are huge. Now we can divide them, you know, 500 billion over 10 years, 50 mm -hmm. billion a year. It's a, it's a big amount of money. And I think the question for me is, if this important is strategic to the West, Ultimately, how are we going to pay for it? I don't see Western taxpayers in a global cost of living crisis with the rise of populism ultimately writing a blank check to pay for Russia's destruction in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And I think what we've seen in, in recent weeks and months, obviously in the US Congress, Ukraine uh, financing becoming a hot political kind of potato, elections in Slovakia, concern about whether you know European alliance can hold together. I'm, I'm just not sure mm -hmm. that putting all on the Western taxpayer uh, will not result in a, p a political backlash in the West, mm -hmm. which will f fuel those populist fires. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, there was a Ukraine reconstruction conference in London in June, and all the focus was on the private sector. The private sector will do the heavy lifting in Europe. I'm in the private sector. Right. I work for an asset manager. Right. We invest in Ukraine. Right. Uh, we invest in many of I can tell you, the private sector is not going to spend 500 billion right. reconstructing Ukraine. Ukraine's in default, it doesn't have access to debt and capital markets, there are huge risks, it's risk. it just destroyed. is not going to yes. happen. Mm -hmm. So the question is for me, put it very differently, mm -hmm. is you know, if the Western taxpayer is not going to pay, they will need to pay, the private sector isn't, where's the money going to come from? Mm -hmm. right? And I, again, I, I know the legal issues are very challenging. Mm -hmm. 
you know, there has been some, you know, the sovereign immunity is an issue. Philip Zeliko wrote a great paper in terms of the use of countermeasures and, you know, uh, the, the sovereign immunity defence only uh, rests when a country is acting in uh, on international law. Russia clearly isn't. Right. Uh, so that's a possibility. But in the end, you know, needs must. Right. This is, a, this is, we're at war. Russia is at war with us. We have to make really difficult decisions, and if the, you know if this project is really important to us, uh -huh. we have to get it done. And if that means changing laws to get it done, mm -hmm. I think we just have to do mm -hmm. that. And you know, I was one of the first people back in you know 18 months ago arguing that this should have been done. You mentioned you know per, you know there's 300 billion of central bank reserves frozen. There's about 100 billion dollars of other Russian assets that are in the Western jurisdictions, mm -hmm. and frankly, nothing's happened. It's staggering, mm -hmm. and our politicians think that taxpayers are just going to write a check for reconstruction and give Russia the money back. How uh, extraordinary is that? All right, Charles, let me let me hear the uh, the counter to that. Counter argument. Well, I mean, many of my arguments are unpopular and I have, I disagree uh, with I absolutely do not disagree with Timothy on uh, his answer to your first question on the moral case. It's impossible to disagree with that. Obviously, uh, Russia owes Ukraine that money. Um, and uh, there's another weakness to the argument I'm about to defend so I'll get the weaknesses out early, which is the notion that uh, holding on to the reserves now will give us a sort of bargaining chip to get uh, Russia to engage in negotiations on mm -hmm. reparations. I mean, perhaps one day, but no time soon. So uh, I'm defending an argument that is difficult to defend, uh, but may more on the basis of the two other questions that you, you asked. Uh, you asked about the, the whether it's legal or not. Uh, there's an additional um, dimension to that, which is uh, whether it's economically sound and whether the precedent is one that we can bear uh, in a world where, uh, which is increasingly divided, uh, where geopolitical rifts are very visible, uh, and where I do think we do want to uh, maintain um, a situation where the likes of China still saves its money uh, in the Western jurisdictions, uh, and Western money is safe in non-Western jurisdictions. I think that's very important. Um, so those are mainly the arguments that I I use uh, to defend my skepticism of taking this measure. Uh, I also share Timothy's uh, frustration with the fact that very little has happened since the uh, blocking or freezing of the reserves. There's a very silly semantic debate about whether we use blocking or freezing, which we don't need to go into. But since that happened, uh, very little has happened in terms of Western governments getting their act together. I do applaud the EU for finally even locating uh, what was uh, located in the EU. Um, a lot of it has ended up in, the, um, in Euroclear because the value was kept in sovereign uh, Okay, I'm bonds. Just, uh, I'll, I'll just finish. I'll just finish. Was, uh, okay. So a lot of it isn't kept in Europe. Claire. I do. We'll get back to that. I do applaud uh, the EU for doing some of the homework on at least locating it. And an idea that I'm sure we're about to discuss in a, in a second is about investing it and giving the interest mm -hmm. to Ukraine. That was an ori originally an idea that was worked mm -hmm. out in a, by EU bureaucrats, uh, and now has received some sort of endorsement by Janet Yellen. Uh, why is she endorsing this EU idea? I think it's a hint that she's also very skeptical of confiscation. I don't think it's going to happen. So I think we need to work on the investment mm -hmm. and giving Ukraine the interest. I know it won't provide the 300 billion. It will be much right. less. I'm aware right. of that. Uh, I'm sorry, I was just going to stop you in case any of our listeners were a little bit confused by when you were mentioning Euroclear and if you could just perhaps specify the money that you're talking about and, and what happened yesterday. Well, I mean, about, uh, what, Euroclear wasn't really discussed yesterday. No, no, um, no, I mean you just, but when you on just your, mentioned on, it now. On Euroclear. Yeah. Uh, so, the reason uh, a lot of the money has ended up in Belgium is that the Russian Central Bank uh, and also to some extent the national, Russian National Welfare Fund were keeping that value in safe uh, sovereign debt. Um, all of that has been repaid, or it's starting to be since the 24th of February when it was blocked, mm -hmm. or actually it was over the weekend, so 26th of February. Um, the sanction forbids um, financial institutions uh, in sanctioning jurisdictions from servicing the Russian Central Bank. So when the money was paid, it arrived at Euroclear, but Euroclear couldn't send it on. So that's why a lot of it has accumulated there. Not the full 200 billion that we think is located in the EU. Uh, some of it, I mean, there are all sorts of special cases. Apparently some um, uh, governments haven't paid it to Euroclear in anticipation that it will be blocked by Euroclear. There are all sorts of details going on and strange things, but it is about 150 billion euros that are already in Euroclear and that, sh that did um, that are there because they, they belong to the Russian uh, uh, Central well, Bank. I mean, is there between both of these points, you know, some kind of bridge between a medium 
point, which is perhaps not all of the assets, uh, the Russian assets, but perhaps using some financial instruments, whether ones that exist or could exist, to use some of the money or the profits and invest them? Or well, do you think that's just not enough money? Sure, I, I will get that. I mean, just coming back, I mean, the, one of the cases against using it is it undermines, as you've mentioned, the position of the dollar as a reserve currency, right? I would argue that if you're Saudi Arabia or you're China or you're an authoritarian regime, the signal's already been sent. The assets have been immobilized or frozen, whatever you call them. You know, they've already moved their assets, right? And I, so I don't think incrementally moving from immobilizing or freezing to seizing and, and allowing Ukraine to use will really change the investment behavior of Saudi or China or any other authoritarian regime. You could argue it will send us a clear signal that, well, if those countries want to go and invade another country, uh -huh. you know, then they are at risk of having their assets seized. So maybe they'll be, you know, they'll co comply with international law a little bit better. Now, in terms of solutions, um, you know, what, obviously there seems to be some kind of agreement that the investment returns on this money held in Euroclear in Belgium can be somehow used by Ukraine. I mentioned about 1.7 billion, I think, for a half year. It doesn't touch the sides. I mean, that's the reality. The Ukrainians have thought very innovatively. They, they're thinking. They mentioned they, they may use it as uh, collateral uh, for war insurance, or they could use it as collateral for new issuance of debt to help them in a debt restructuring, for example, to allow them to easy access the market. But again, it's just not enough. Now, what if you could thought really innovatively? What's the difference between investing uh, Russian assets as Euroclear, allowing uh, Euroclear to invest in something with a high yield? For example, they could invest in a portfolio of emerging market debt yielding 10%. <laughs> right. So instead of 1.7 billion, right. 400 billion, 10% mm -hmm. yield, 40 billion a year, right. which gets towards what we kind of need True. for, we just need to think innovatively and outside right. the box, right? Also assuming that those nations are not in danger of default. <laughs> well, you know, that. in the end, you know, right. <laughs> you can figure something out right. that delivers what we want. Right. I mean, also interestingly, you could, Ukraine could issue restitution bonds, recovery bonds, whatever you, what do you call it, mm -hmm. and Euroclear assets could be used, to, Russian Euroclear assets mm -hmm. could be used to buy those. Right. Ukraine could get the capital, you know, mm -hmm. a direct transfer. Russia would still own the underlying asset. Mm -hmm. You're not taking away its property rights. Right. And in fact, interestingly, in that scenario, Russia could, into its account, could get the yield, the, the interest paid by Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But Ukraine gets the upfront capital right. immediately. I just don't think, you know, it's like bean counters who are running this process. People who I think have no geopolitical right. perspective, mm -hmm. they don't really understand how important this victory is and how important getting a successful recovery is. And at the moment, we are failing. That is the reality. Right. I mean, Charles, I think you clearly do understand the geopolitical consequences and the big picture. Um, but but where would you differ from Tim in, in your, your kind of analysis of what he just said? I just differ on uh, my um, fears of the precedent it would create. I understand Timothy's point about um, this sending a signal to uh, a China or a Saudi Arabia that if they invade a neighboring country, then their reserves would be uh, confiscated as well. Uh, fine. but. Uh, um, I'm more worried about the immediate situation, and I do think there is a, a much more radical nature to this step uh, than the blocking. The blocking, there is the notion of uh, a, a sanction, a temporary block on what belongs to you uh, to punish your behavior, and that can be lifted at some point. Confiscation is radically different, uh, so I think that's where we differ. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not reversible. And it's not reversible. And we would be on the hook to pay Russia right. back should a court uh, rule that we owe them that right. money. And I think it would be pretty easy for Russia to find a court to issue that ruling. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Tim, I understand your argument in terms of this is kind of perhaps the most important post-war project that we have, which is rebuilding Ukraine in terms of keeping peace. Um, but there's another policy argument that I've heard, which basically says there's no way that reconstruction is not going to happen, at least with the tacit approval of Russia. Now, that tacit approval may only come with regime change, but Russia has the ability anytime it wants, you know, a bridge starts being built to just bomb it out again. And that perhaps keeping this money as a bargaining chip could be what's used to get Russia's tacit approval. Well, frankly, we froze it 
or immobilised it, and it didn't change Russia's behaviour. So I'm not sure going to freeze to, to seize it will, will change it. And the reality is, Ukraine recovery is happening already. Right, the Ukrainian economy is incredibly resilient. You know, it's functioning, which is quite remarkable. You know, banks work, money works, infrastructure works. The railways work better than the UK. I mean, quite extraordinary. <laughs> better, 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 better than Germany. Yeah, so I, I don't think. You know, I don't think. You know, it, it's going to happen. Russia. You know. Ukraine has shown with its uh, uh, attacks into Russia itself. I mean, the, obviously the drone attacks, the strikes into into Crimea, which is obviously not not Russia. Uh, it, it's shown that it can also uh, undermine and destabilize the Russian economy. So it works both ways. Um, recovery and reconstruction is going to happen when the war ends. I, I'm very bullish on Ukraine, but in the end, it still needs financing. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see. We, there's lots of recovery conferences. Mm -hmm. you know, London. There's going to be a German one. There was sort of uh, a Lugano. Mm, Swiss one. Lots of talks. Lots of government officials go there and talk about the private sector. Not many private sector people go there, right? So uh, yet, how are we going to write uh, the check? How are we going to pay for yeah. this? In fact, I've, I've been to several of those conferences and I've talked to several businesses uh, as, as well as Ukrainian officials. And basically what I hear is that there are no, I mean, no private companies or let's I found a few, but there's hardly any private companies that are coming into Ukraine now because of insurance, because of guarantees, because the war is still going on. And you know, clearly, you're going to need those kind of guarantees and insurance going out down down the line. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about this issue of de-dollarization, so that you know, the dollar is kind of the at the moment the universal currency. Um, and there there was. Uh, concerns about risk, and I think there's no evidence that that's happening in the short term, certainly if you look at investments uh, or even invoicing. Um, but uh, how real do you think that is going forward? I mean, China, as long as China has capital controls, uh, its currency is not going to be used uh, as an international currency. And I was surprisingly hearing people um, say that they were skeptical skeptical that the euro could serve that role because who knows if the euro will be around in 20 years. Uh, so would you like to, <laughs> both being too polite, uh, first of all on, on the Chinese currency and whether it can serve the same role as a dollar, clearly you've given the main reason why it cannot because of capital controls. That being said, uh, for a country that doesn't have the choice, like Russia, um, it has become their key currency for uh, saving value for transactions, um, and uh, that has been accompanied by more investments mm -hmm. in gold as well. So when countries don't have the choice, mm -hmm. they do use the yuan. Mm -hmm. And then obviously China has more control over how they buy and sell, mm -hmm. how they save money, which isn't a pleasant situation to be in. But uh, when there are no alternatives, people do use the Chinese mm -hmm. currency. Important little detail. Uh, on the euro, um, so I do remember these debates about the euro, be, whether it will be around in a few years. I mean, I don't want to be um, too optimistic about mm -hmm. the euro, but I think those debates are a few years old. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's the eurozone has shown quite a lot of resilience. We could debate about whether it was a good choice in the first place and whether it's an optimal currency union. Happy to have those debates, but uh, I do think the euro is here to stay uh, and that its infrastructure is uh, fairly strong. And it, it does, in many, in the composition of many current, many countries, mm -hmm. FX reserves, it does have quite an important role. Uh, clearly, it's the ones that are closer to the EU than further away, but it is playing that role. Mm -hmm. I would just say, I mean, looking now at the war that we have, you know, one big takeout is the West has shown an abundance of caution, and that's failed Ukraine. Whether it's supplying S-300s or MiG-29s at the start, or HIMARS or uh, F-16s, in the end, you know, we were overly concerned about some of these risks that didn't appear. And I would say this concern about, you know, using frozen Russian assets and its, its impact on dollarization, I think we're just too cautious about mm -hmm. it. And um, I would say another big takeout is, has been the, uh, is the strength of the Western uh, alliance. The fact that you know, f very few countries actually uh, are willing to, to go against sanctions. Mm -hmm. you know, countries yeah. are very careful to comply. It shows right. the strength. Even, even Chinese banks yes. are really careful not to get the wrong end of the US yes. Treasury. So I think it kind of shows to everyone that actually we still have economic right. power and weight, and uh -huh. we, we're just too cautious, and we need to be, you know, if we want to win this war, 
we, because Ukraine is fighting for us and our defence, for European defence, uh, and we want to win the, uh, and achieve the recovery, we just have to think more innovatively and, you know, don't, you know, move away from that over-cautious approach. Right. But let me ask you uh, to think about this in another way, and, and obviously no one knows what the end game of this is going to be. Few people think there's going to be a very clear-cut, uh, at least that's my impression, a very clear-cut end with surrender, you know, at best maybe some kind of ceasefire or armistice. In terms of these discussions which are happening and the timing of uh, whether to move from freezing to actually confiscation or whether some other, you know, using his guarantees or insurance. Is there an argument about timing, like whether it makes sense to do it earlier or later or do it in increments um, in terms of whether persuading uh, or using any kind of uh, incentives to get some type of agreement? Well. You know, I've written an awful lot on the subject. I mean, there, there hasn't been a lot of focus in my mind about really managing the recovery and reconstruction. The West is putting a lot of money in, taxpayers' dollars into this. And I would think that, given the project is so important, I think it deserves an agency on its own right. You know, we created the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction mm -hmm. and Development, do the transition from mm -hmm. plan to market, 89, 91. It's been incredibly successful. You know, I think there needs to be a, some similar agency that is jointly managed by Western, Western uh, allies and Ukraine to make sure, to, to, you know, to give assurance to taxpayers that the money's been spent in the right way and to deliver a successful recovery. Uh, it's, it's every man for himself, actually. I mean, <laughs> there seems to be not, really not much coordination, mm -hmm. which again, 18 months in, Mm -hmm. Lots of you know talk about reconstruction. Lots of conferences. Not not really much substantive. Right. Uh, uh, I agree. Um, I just, uh, just want okay. to say I do agree on um, the EBRD setting an example. I think the EBRD will probably play a key role as the hub for the thinking on this. They know Ukraine better than uh, other agencies um, and um, multilateral development banks that have a lot of goodwill to Ukraine but don't know the country. So I think it may just be the EBRD um, or something that, you know a special mm -hmm. unit within the EBRD uh, that does it. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps slightly cheeky remark, but I don't think the EBRD is in favor of um, uh, confiscating the reserves. They're very careful about saying mm -hmm. it, but they, from what I can tell, uh, they're mm -hmm. quite cautious about it as well. The EBRD are not experts in geopolitics. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the problem, I have with EBRD, the problem I have with EBRD is their shareholder structure. Mm -hmm. Their shareholder structure includes Russia. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, think, no, I don't, no think, now, I don't think you can, I mean, EBRD's mandate is very broad. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, the whole transition of for emerging, you know, it's expanded to North Africa, to broader development. You know, as I said, this project is the number one project for us, for Western liberal market democracy in this region. I think. Charles, do you agree with that? I think it's. Um Yes, basically, I agree with everything Timothy has said about it being a, a very, uh, an essential project for um, for the, the EU, for the UK, for America. That Ukraine is a success. Yes, mm -hmm. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and let me just now circle back to this issue of timing in terms of you know how to deal with the Russian assets. Would it would it be more powerful to take steps as soon as possible, or you know, kind of? set up some process down the road as we get hopefully closer to a, some kind of We didn't answer your question. <laughs> we didn't answer it before. I mean, look, clearly... It needs I'm to, a reporter. It, it needs I'm to used to people okay. not answering my questions. It, it wasn't my intention. <laughs> I know. Uh, look, we need to make the decision that these assets should be used. Right. Now, again, we need to put the money on the table. We need to figure out, you know... And then you could disperse it over a long period of time. I don't think anyone wants 400 billion dispersed to Ukraine <laughs> right. for a, a 200 billion dollar economy. No, no one's thinking right, about that. Right. But we need to think, think long term and how mm -hmm. it's funded. And you know, again, innovative solutions about investing the, this money in a, in a better way that gets a, be, a mm -hmm. better yield. I think is obvious, mm -hmm. right? I just don't understand why people, you know, uh, there's such a big pushback. Again, bottom line is how are we going to fund it? Mm -hmm. So. Um, I, I agree with your framing of the um, sort of nerdy economists and lawyers disagreeing with uh, the, geopolit <laughs> the geopolitics people. Um, just because I'm visiting from Washington, I, I can tell you that that's precisely what's going on in the US government. I mean, uh, Jake Sullivan sent uh, a letter to Treasury or an email these days, probably an email, say, asking them to figure it out. Is this mm. possible? He's in favor. The answer was no. 
that was the answer from Treasury. You could say Treasury isn't geopolitically aware. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that uh, it's wrong to um, completely distinguish the two. I think Treasury does have a geopolitical self-awareness, but in this sort of realm of economic precedent and what it means, not only for the role of the dollar, but also for the safety of Western assets in um, countries that aren't our allies. So I think that's where the concern comes from. And I don't think it's completely geopolitically naive. I think it, it's a different way of looking at the, at the issue. Uh, and on the, on the question of the staggering, I think where, where Timothy and I uh, share a frustration, and a similar one, is that nothing has really happened other than finding the assets. But other than that, nothing intelligent has been done with them. Euroclear itself has invested the money and made quite a nice profit. Uh, because they don't have the infrastructure uh, to invest in anything other than overnight um, right. uh, products with central banks, uh, it's been invested, shall we say, very inefficiently. So much more could be done with it. With their inefficient investments that have still increased their profits, the Belgian government has acknowledged that Euroclear has paid more tax this year and therefore it's increased its contribution to Ukraine. 100 million compared right. to 300 billion that we're talking right. about. So I am frustrated about that. Right. I think there's much more we can do, uh -huh. but we disagree on what to do. Uh -huh. All right, well, I think we're running out of time now, but uh, thank you both so much for uh, laying out your points of view. And uh, I have a feeling uh, next year we might be discussing this very same topic again <laughs> at this meeting. Perhaps. Thank you. Thank you.